the Medical School HQ podcast, session number 102. Hello, and welcome back to the Medical School Headquarters podcast, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your pre-med success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. The MCAT is changing in 2015, and January is your last chance to take the current exam. If you are one of the few students that has a seat before the MCAT changes, you need to listen to this. You want to maximize your score so you don't have to worry about retaking the MCAT as a completely new test. Visit our partners at Next Step Test Prep and find out why one of our Academy members said she, quote, received more value than what I paid for. If you are taking the current exam before the end of January 2015, mention you heard about Next Step from the Medical School Headquarters podcast and get $100 off their amazing one-on-one MCAT tutoring. Again, that's nextsteptestprep.com. Our guest today is Neil Christopher, a current third-year medical student at Western University of Health Sciences College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific. He's a very non-traditional medical student, having switched careers after working as a minister for several years. We're going to discuss why he switched gears how he navigated going back to school, and some of the bumps and triumphs along the way. Neil, welcome to the Medical School Headquarters podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks so much for inviting me, and congratulations to you for having so many episodes and filling uh, what is a great need. I I listen to a podcast that uh, used to be out there, I don't think it is anymore, uh, on my journey, and uh, they need something like what you're providing. for those that are still trying to uh, get in and even in the first uh, couple of years of med school. So congratulations and, and thanks for uh, helping so many others. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to be over 100 episodes now. It's, it's crazy to think we've been doing it this long. Well, I'm a student and I still listen uh, every now and then. So a uh, little bit of a fanboy here, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. So the, the first question I have to ask you is if you're a Mac or a PC guy. <laughs> Well, I started out with PC, but I am a raving, unapologetic Apple user through and through. Uh, I, during my transition, as I applied to medical school, um, having a family, I needed some income, and I actually went to work for Apple for three years um, in uh, business-to-business uh, consulting and sales, and uh, had a great time there, but... Um, but yeah, I pretty much can't use anything other than Apple and uh, get a little frustrated uh, if uh, someone tries to force me out of that mold because I don't have time to learn new stuff right now. So <laughs> That's awesome. I have this philosophy or this, this theory. It's not really a philosophy. I have this theory that if the healthcare world went Mac only, prescription errors would decrease by half. Um, Mortality in the hospital would decrease by half. Uh, physician satisfaction would double. I, I think. <laughs> I think if we get feces out of there, well, every everybody will be better. I don't, yeah, I don't know if medical errors would go down, but certainly <laughs> the efficiency of the electronic medical record would uh, would definitely increase. It would be better. I, I just uh, you know, came off a rotation in emergency medicine where I was showing the physician some shortcuts uh, that I use. And I was so much faster at generating notes than the physicians were that wow. uh, just due to the technology and, and not having to constantly learn, learn new stuff. So Yeah, I, I just showed Allison how to use a text expander program for her, her PC at work. So she's digging that. <laughs> so, yes. Well, we'll geek out at, at more tech stuff in a little bit. But you mentioned your emergency medicine rotation. Right now, you're a third-year osteopathic medical student at that is correct. What, what you would consider the longest medical school name ever, Western University of Health <laughs> Sciences College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific. You did it in one breath. Congratulations. Not to be confused with of the Atlantic, but there isn't one, so that's okay. <laughs> that's right. So that's awesome, and, and we'll talk about your current status now as a medical student, but yeah. you worked as this... This Apple guy, this Apple yeah. guru, 
Yeah. During a transition. So you had a prior life prior to being a medical student. So you, you're a non-traditional student, which a lot of the listeners are. Let's, let's talk about your, your past life. What, what did you used to do? So, yeah, I am a non-traditional student. I'm currently uh, 39 years old, so very non-traditional. I'm actually not the oldest uh, person in our class. There were four students older than me. Uh, the oldest was 52 uh, during our first year. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so all his kids were grown, so he was in a different uh, place than me. But, um, but yeah, I was actually uh, a minister uh, uh, for a church, for a number of churches, actually, and then... Um, always knew that I was going, going to go on and do a doctorate in something, uh, thought it was going to be a PhD in uh, philosophy or ethics or something like that. And I was sitting in a post-master's degree graduate class and a seminar, and we were going over philosophy of science and some different arguments. And all of a sudden, kind of my whole journey kind of came together in this one moment, and I realized that what I loved uh, was translating knowledge into people's lives. And whether that is as a pastor or as a physician, uh, I am able to do that. Uh, the source of knowledge may change, but impacting other people's lives is really what I'm good at. And I'm way too extroverted to uh, be a bench scientist or something like that. So uh, it all made sense. I thought I'd been in school so long at this point that um, a semester of post back science classes wouldn't throw anything off. I tried it. I loved it. I got into a uh, genetics um, a research, um, some bioinformatics stuff uh, combined with that, and um, just had a great time and um, ended up going forward and, and applying to, I think, uh, 12 medical schools. Um, I gave up on the allopathic schools pretty early due to my age. Uh, one of the uh, assistant directors of admissions from one school actually said he would never admit someone with my background. Um, not quite sure why. I, I assume it was because of a, some sort of perceived anti-scientific bent or something like that. I really don't know what he meant. But um, uh, one of the nice things about the osteopathic schools is they really value... Um, diversity. They really value um, uh, an age span, and they definitely don't punish you for for coming from a different path. And they actually encourage it, mm -hmm. uh, as, assuming that you meet the uh, basic requirements to get into medical school. Uh, yeah. That's not going to change. And that's, that's not going to change. That's disappointing to hear that that a a dean or an assistant dean or or anybody associated with a medical school told you that. And and it's kind of more disappointing that it came from an allopathic school. I, I would, it, my personal opinion is that is one person's opinion and not necessarily a DOMD thing um, that, that you'll run into that possibly uh, not everywhere in the MD world, but probably more than the DO world. I absolutely agree with that, Ryan. And and looking around, I probably should have uh, you know expanded my options. There are some you know um, I mean there's uh, Loma Linda, which is a religious medical school. There's some Catholic medical schools. Uh, there's plenty of other options out there. Uh, again, having the family that puts some additional restrictions on where I could and couldn't apply. But uh, but I applied ultimately to twelve schools. Uh, was offered seven interviews. I took five of them. And I was ultimately accepted at, at four of those five. So I had some options, which was nice. Uh, and, and thankfully, I didn't actually have to move. Um, but uh, that's kind of my um, journey of getting into medical school. So that, obviously a very successful pre-med path. Let's talk about briefly what, what do you think made you a successful pre-med student having been away from school for so long and something totally different than the hard sciences? Um, I think having success in the other areas uh, helps um, because what, you know, what they don't want to see is that you tried a career or two and you were, you know, bad at one of them or both of them, or you were mediocre at one or uh, one of them or both of them. They definitely want to see some sort of success. Um, and, and what's nice about being a pre-med is you get to define how you're going to tell your story. And, and I think the biggest thing that I learned in, um, in telling that story uh, um, is 
when you present, whether it's your, your, your written statement or whether it's your elevator speech or, or, or whatever it is, your, your response to the interview questions, they all need to point in one direction. They also need to be true, but they need to, be, they need to point in one direction. And if that direction shows how all of your past is pointing towards uh, this new journey that you're going to go on through medicine, uh, you're much more likely to... Uh, to get in and, and be viewed as uh, favorable, and and it, and and you want it to kind of make sense, and they'll go, oh yeah, I can see how these things were pointing uh, toward pointing you towards this. So that's a that's a good way to kind of wrap it up um, to to state that. I like that. So I mean, you still got to have a basic MCAT. You <laughs> yeah. still got to have yeah. you still got to have a basic science GPA. Uh, that stuff is you know it's not going to go away. The even on the osteopathic side, uh, the scores uh, keep going up. I know at Western, our current MCAT scores is actually um, this year's class coming in. The dean just told me the other day it's higher than than a number of, of other schools around the nation, uh, uh, both allopathic and osteopathic. So, you know, it, you've got to have those basic requirements. But outside of those, you know, um, having a story that makes sense and points you in that one direction will help. What is your thought on how a a non-traditional student like yourself, somebody that's in a totally different career that's listening to this and and has that dream of going back into medical school, what's what's the first step that you took that that maybe you would recommend somebody else take to to start down that path? I would say they really need to pick uh, where they're going to take their classes uh, carefully. Um, while there are plenty of, of places that offer their classes from, you know, online to community college to um, um, do it yourself post back to a formal post back, um, your choice needs to make sense. I actually uh, had to decide between a very formal post back um, with about an hour and a half of traffic from uh, one of the California state schools. Uh, and one that was literally just down the road, uh, but you didn't get a degree at the end of it. But it was affiliated uh, with another medical school, and I chose less traffic so that I could have more study time and a little bit more family time. And um, so, picking where you where you do those courses, um, not making any mistakes, uh, any big mistakes, at least once you begin that official pre med journey, if you will. Is, uh, is pretty important. Everyone get, is allowed some mistakes uh, along the way because no one looks perfect on paper. But at some point, you have to show you made a decision and you, you, know, you got the right advice uh, from someone along the way. And from that point, um, you weren't really making too many mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So you went and you... you applied to these schools, you interviewed at a bunch, you got accepted at a, at, at a bunch. You have a family, you have children. Yes. yes. Talk about those decisions and, and where you decided to go to school and how that affected your family. And, and let's talk some, some family stuff. Um, it is pretty important to me not to, um, <laughs> not to lose that. And, uh, I, I had a number of goals. One was to, uh, graduate from medical school happily married. If I couldn't do that, I would like to graduate from medical school married. And if I couldn't do that, I'd like to just stay married. And so, um, um, you know, I gave my wife a veto power during the pre-med process. So at any moment prior to starting medical school, she could tell me no. And that's not something that other people might be willing to do, but for me, that was important for, for the kind of person I wanted to be. And so um, she thought about it long and hard, I'm sure. She never told me no. And so knowing that, that I had that support and also letting her know pretty clearly that once medical school starts, you can't change your mind. So she had you know more than two years to make that decision. Uh, but once it started, uh, she may have wished she made that decision on some particular days, but... Um, but we had already kind of agreed and negotiated ahead of time. Uh, also, knowing that I'm not going to be at the top of the class and giving up on that dream, um, that, that, that happened very early on. I think it was the first anatomy test of first year. Um, and just realizing that um, my view of success uh, has to be defined you know, by me and, and, and what I'm trying to 
uh, get to and the kind of physician I want to be is, is, you know, yes, it would be nice to be at, at the top of the class and, and everything, but uh, that's just not going to happen. And so uh, learning that my identity is more of this multi-skilled type of physician that can, um, you know, be successful in different ways, uh, and I'm okay with that now. Awesome. Talk about the transition into medical school and and as a non-traditional student going through a post bac how how that change uh was perceived was it was it a drastic change or was it as easy as you thought it would be no no it was not easy at all i mean you you think o chem is hard you know you think <laughs> it's hard and um and the when you're in you the know, middle what, of it it is hard it is sure yes everyone's pain hurts to them and and it, it is hard but it's Everything, every shift seems to be an order of magnitude harder. You know, it's it's not just you know times two or times three. You're moving the decimal, and and um, and it's hard to conceive. And everyone says that. You know, everyone says it's like you know drinking from a fire hose and all this stuff. And and it's all actually true. Um, I guess it's like lawyer jokes when you go to law school. They're all actually true. They they really are that bad. I've I've heard so. Um, but the medical school really is as difficult as you think. And, you know, being non-traditional, being post um, um you know, the change in your schedule and your diet. Uh, I mean, just one of the big changes is I was a pretty active uh, uh, triathlete and I even done some half Ironman type events. And I gained 39 pounds of, you know, <laughs> obesity in those first. <laughs> and not pure muscle? Those, yes, not muscle. There's no muscle in there. Uh, just because I, I couldn't... I couldn't do everything that I wanted to do, um, and that was the biggest change, I think, from those first two years is just realizing, um, yes, I'm willing to make those sacrifices and make those changes, but you, you, can't, um, you can't do everything that you want to do, and so you, you have to let some things go in order to be successful in others, and, um, and, and that was the biggest part of the change for me. Mm, that's good to know. So... You've gotten very involved in politics at your school and being a student president second year. Right. What made you get involved uh, in that side of things? (laughs) Well, uh, without getting into all the specifics of why, I mean, one of the big things was just, you know, medical school is so stressful and, um, and there's different types of faculty and administrators at every school and some of them are pro student and some of them are kind of anti student and wonder why the students are even there and <laughs> and some of them, and the vast majority of them are probably just kind of neutral about the whole situation they're there to do their research or or work their clinic or see patients or whatever they're there to do um, but uh, some of the policies definitely could be changed this would be true at every school and and we had a policy about uh, actually about apple uh, tech and and they wouldn't support it um, and you'd look around the cl- classroom, granted we're on the West Coast, uh, but uh, 70%, almost 70%, I think it was 67% of our class was using Apple stuff, and, and they refused to support it in the IT department. And so um, I said, well, that's something I can get changed. And, uh, you know, no one ran against me, and so there I was kind of put into the position. Uh, got that policy changed, but I didn't realize that to get that policy changed, I had to also become a non-voting member of the board of trustees and so it ended up being a much bigger deal than I thought it was going to be but uh, it was a great experience um obviously I got to meet a lot of you know important and and fun people and you know powerful people and that may or may not help me in the future I don't know but just learning how to talk with them how to debate with them how to uh advocate for policy changes and and yet learning to live within the confines of the budget you're given uh it was a it was a nice uh, a view of a, of the political side of education and and as it crosses over into medicine a little bit as well i think it's a a very important skill set to have not only during medical school uh but residency as well there's a lot of dynamics there and and when you're working, whether you're in private practice or working in a group, there's always going to be those dynamics and having those communication skills are are paramount um, to to your happiness and, and the success of, of your practice overall. Yeah, and it's, again, it's important to learn as you're going through the pre-med or medical school journey too to, 
not to become less of the type of person that you're meant to be, but to really become more of that person because you're not going to be able to do everything you want. And I fought, I think, that leadership drive for so long trying to, you know, do this or that or some other thing. And I just realized that while I may not be the best person at making decisions or giving speeches or, or what have you, but I'm, I'm definitely okay at some of these things, and I'm certainly better than some others at some of these things. And so that is part of the type of person I am, so it will also be part of the type of physician that I will be. Awesome. Let's talk DOMD a little bit. We, we've talked a little bit about it. And, and you'd mentioned why you applied kind of osteopathic only, which I don't fully agree with, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's one of my, my biggest uh, things I, I want to get out there to everybody. Um, but one, one of the biggest things in the news lately is this merger with the postgraduate medical education and how residencies are kind of monitored and, and accredited and everything. And you had some some experience with that whole process. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so as my um, student presidency was coming to a close, I was appointed um, kind of as a junior political officer, student officer for the uh, osteopathic physicians and surgeons of California on one of their committees. So I did get some exposure to this whole process. And, you know, my view is still the, as a student, I mean, this my, my views don't represent Western, or they don't represent um, necessarily the osteopathic physicians of California, but but um, it's a big change. And a few years ago, the ACGME, which is the accrediting body for um, allopathic residencies, um, decided that they needed to make some changes and continue to improve their processes. And um, one of those changes was. I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but it was going to impact uh, DO graduates such that they could not get uh, fellowships um, if um, if they didn't go through uh, the ACGM, ACGME process from day one. So the example might be you graduate from medical school with a DO, you go to a AOA or a DO uh, internal medicine residency, then you could not say go to a cardiology fellowship um, on the ACGME side. And they had a number of reasons for doing that. They weren't being mean or specifically targeting. They're just trying to improve their system, which is fine. And so um, the AOA went to the ACGME and, and basically said, hey, you're going to kind of hurt a lot of our graduates and a lot of our graduates you've loved having over the years. Is there some other options here? And they tried it once and uh, our side, the AOA side, ended up rejecting it. And uh, they kind of let it sit for a year. And uh, there's huge uh, student movement to put it back into play because we obviously, as DO students and uh, future physicians, don't want our uh, fellowship uh, fellowships limited. And so uh, for whatever reason, it got put back on the table and they came up with a better deal that's more amenable. And they're actually going to create a new ACGME. So it will continue to have the same name, but it'll be a new legal organization that will have osteopathic uh, representation. And they will now be the one and only certifying agency for all graduate medical a uh, education uh, in the United States. And, and this really is a win-win. And the vast majority of osteopathic and allopathic students and physicians uh, support this, and I certainly am one of those that support it. Um, I think it's a good move for medicine uh, in the United States. That's awesome, and, and I, I think it's it's uh, very much needed. And and my again, I have I have lots of theories. My my theory is that in in twenty to thirty years, there will be no DOMD differentiation in medical school training as well. That that every that there would be a single unifying uh, governing body uh, over medical schools training as well. I I think we're definitely headed that way. It it will be interesting to see. But if you if you're familiar at all with the dentistry, uh, there were two paths uh, in dentistry at one point, and we don't even realize this anymore when we pull up to go to the dentist. You'll see two degrees, either a DDS or a DMD. And while there were differences in the past, they no longer exist. And I, I think that's what will happen uh, within about 20 years in the medical world as well. Yeah. Good. That's great. 
what do you think as as now you're on on the path to getting your do and you've been involved in all of this um uh, political side of the the ACGME um merger for a student that's going through the process now trying to figure out should I apply to DO should I apply to MD how do I sell to a DO school that I that I truly really want to go to DO what's what's your recommendation for those students that that are going down that path trying to figure out wh- where to apply and and osteopathic uh, allopathic uh, I think that you definitely, if you want to go DO school, um, every DO school that I'm familiar with is well aware that the students are applying, the vast majority of students are applying to both. At least the students who apply to DO schools, the vast majority of them have also applied to uh, non-DO schools as well. And, and so uh, they're very well aware of this. If you were to pretend um, that, that that's different, it would kind of put you out. Uh, by yourself. But one of the things that you could do is definitely have a position on your view of what you think is osteopathic philosophy. Um, And this is where I I agree with um, things that you guys have said on this podcast and other places in the past. I think uh, Allison said it uh, just a few episodes ago, talking about the DO philosophy, and, and it's not restricted to DOs anymore. And, you know, my opinion is that if the views that uh, A.T. Steele wanted, he was basically just a medical reformer mm-hmm. from a long time ago. And, and if, if, um, if, other, if any practitioner, regardless of MD, DO, or some European degree or, or wherever, has the view that they want to do more than just cure the chief complaint, but they actually want to treat the whole person as much as they can in that encounter, then that philosophy that's behind the DO has, has already won, regardless of the degree. And, and, and there's plenty of physicians from various backgrounds that, um, that want to do that. So we don't own that philosophy anymore. We don't, we don't own that. But having said that, you need to be aware of the historical influences when you're going into a DO interview. You need to uh, have read at least some excerpts from A.T. Still and have an opinion about it. Otherwise, it will just look like this is a school that is maybe a safety school for you that you don't actually want to go to. Certainly, if you're only applying to DO schools, um, I think it is okay to say that. And whether that or not that will um, gain you any extra quote-unquote points, I don't know. That would depend on who's interview you, interviewing you and what school you're at and maybe even the time of year that you're interviewing. But, um, but uh, it certainly would be appropriate to say uh, that I believe in this philosophy so much that I'm only applying to DO schools or, or something like that. I like it. I like it a lot. And that's, and that's what I, I've told people. And that was me that, that told Allison that it doesn't belong to DOs only. <laughs> I'll, I'll correct you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But yeah. Uh, and and I, I think I've said before that the, the AT still exactly what you said. He was a, he was a medical reformer. And he wanted something better than what physicians were doing back then. And when you actually think about what they were doing back then with bloodletting and other random, completely horrific things, then yeah, I, I'm glad. I'm glad he came along and and started uh, reforming medicine. But so thank you, At Still, for everything we have in medicine now. <laughs> well, at least a little piece of it. And and I really do see myself in that tradition. I mean, I'm probably one of the few students in my class that read all of his writings and uh and I don't necessarily agree with uh, a lot of the uh scientific part, but the philosophical part has definitely proven out and I just can see myself as one more person in this chain of of hopefully I will reform something as well, maybe just a tiny little piece, but uh, but that doesn't mean – that's not what it means to be a DO. What it means to be a DO is just to be a physician who's going to be a part of this bigger world of, of medicine who hopefully will make some changes both in the individual patient and in medicine as a whole as well. Awesome. Neil, what has been your hardest obstacle on this whole journey, whether it's pre-med or medical school? Probably the time management because there are things that I just would not give up on. I want my children to know who I am and I want them to be happy uh, with me as their dad. Um, I want my marriage to be 
as stable and as happy as possible. And there's definitely times when that's easier than others. Um, but uh, our third child was a surprise to us. Um, <laughs> we we uh, 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 you prepared. you weren't in medical school yet, so you didn't know how that whole process worked. <laughs> yeah, one of the deans actually said, "Do you need to uh, repeat the <laughs> repro?" And so I don't know. Maybe I do, but uh, you know, we actually thought uh, thought we were infertile uh, for a number of years, and so uh, here comes a surprise uh, child for us, and she is born. Uh, she is a great joy to us, but she is born the first week into my dedicated board study. Uh. Yeah, so. Uh, when my my best medical school friend and, and and study partner found out, he just went you know white and almost passed out on me when he realized the timing of the birth. Um, so that was the single biggest challenge is is just trying to meet all of my goals in terms of husband, father, and medical students studying for the boards at the end of my second year. Um, it was very challenging. I did not think that I could pull through that. Um, and I did, you know, I passed it. I passed it with a margin of safety, but I did not reach um, my my goals in terms of my score. And so I will have to make up for that um, probably in some other way on my uh, step two, level two scores in order to get the, um, you know, the interviews that I want. So, okay. Well, good luck with that journey. At the, at the beginning, we promised some um, tech geekery. You you are a, a former Apple Store employee or Apple employee, the class tech representative. What are some fun tech things that have helped you along the way that you think others could benefit from to help with some of that time management, maybe and, and e- efficiency? Yeah, um, there's there's definitely a few quick ones. Uh, for me, one of the most helpful things was uh, a pretty simple thing, but whatever you're using for a calendar, you want to get really good at it. And and we had some weird policy changes that happened in terms of how our calendar was distributed and stuff like that. So I ended up just creating a PDF of every course, of the calendar of every course. And I would actually put slashes on the PDF editor um, through every time I went through a lecture. And if I got three slashes through that lecture for every lecture coming up for that exam, I did well on that exam. Uh, and if I didn't, I could go back and, and I guarantee the, the questions I missed were from the lectures that only had one or two slashes. So for me, just a, something to both manage my time to see which lectures I had studied more than once and which ones I hadn't, uh, just whether it's a calendar program or a PDF editor uh, on your Mac, a PC, or you know your iPad or other um, uh, tablet, um, that is key. You need a calendaring program. You need a PDF editor most likely. Uh, what I helped a lot of other students do is um, also get the slides um, whether they're in PowerPoint form or PDF form. There's usually a slide editor that you can um, put these slides in and write your notes right on the slide. So, for instance, um, you know, we were using iPads a lot, a lot of of my friends, and so uh, we would just load the uh, slides and write right on them. Um, I think the app that most people use is called iAnnotate, and uh, if, you know, if you're using iOS, that should work well for you. And uh, a lot of times you can just take notes right on the slide. If your school doesn't um, send out the uh, videos, which most of them do, uh, then you need, to, you need a program probably to record the audio. Um, uh, the one that I like on iOS is called Notability. Uh, there's a number of apps if you're using a full laptop that could do that. But um, Notability, you can type while the audio is recording and then go back to that specific point um, where you typed that the audio was playing, which is nice. But most schools now um, distribute the video, and a lot of students you'll find, uh, this may be surprising to the pre-meds, but there'll be certain courses when you just, there's so many lectures you actually cannot go to class or you won't have enough time to get through them all. And so learning to play back these lectures um, at double speed um, and even some slower professors. I, could, I think I got up to 2.6 speed with one particular professor. Um, having the right software to do that. Uh, on, a, on a PC or a Mac, you can use uh, some free software actually called uh, VLC Player. 
and that will do that for you for most uh, video formats. Mm-hmm. Uh, on iOS, uh, it's also nice to have one, and the one that I like is um, called Speed Up TV. I think it's about five bucks or so, and um, just having one of my devices playing the video very fast, and the other one for taking my own notes or doing flashcards uh, that was on the same content. Um, that's for me was the most helpful thing, but you absolutely need a video uh, player that can speed up these yeah. videos because you don't have time to go through them at at one speed. And test them all a little bit differently because they're they're how they're written. Some are better at speeding up the quality, and and some are not. So there's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they get so fast that you can't uh, understand, or it they sounds sound like, like a chipmunk. chipmunk. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. Uh, yeah. You're not going to be able to listen yeah. very long. And that's how I listen yeah. to podcasts too. I, I listen to them sped up. So if you're listening to me sped up right now, then then that's good. Um, I, I don't know right. if I've ever listened to myself sped up though. I have to try that. It'd be interesting. Be- so I, I, I want to touch on something that you mentioned and and point out how awesome that feature is. You you talked about Notability as one of the uh, iPad apps. And I think they actually just came out with a Mac app as well, like a, a full... Oh, that's right. They did. They did. A, a full app for your, your MacBook Air Pro or whatever you're using. But to record the audio in the room so you just you hit record and it's just recording through your microphone on your phone and you're taking notes if when you go back and you're reading your notes and you're like i have no idea what i was trying to say here what what notes i was doing you you click play and it knows where in the notes you're trying to 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 go back to and it'll play the audio from that time and it's it's an awesome feature that that i wish was around i, I wish it was around when i was in school yeah I agree. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that I think the listeners need to understand, too, is that what works for one course is, may not work and may be detrimental to the next course. And so you have to adapt both your study habits and maybe even the technology that you're using. Uh, you know, when I was in anatomy, uh, which for us is a, a very long foundational course, uh, I think it's still that way at a lot of schools, but, but not all now. And um, the, the digital textbooks that would uncover, um, you know, particular parts of the anatomy and then cover them back up. So it's essentially flashcards that you don't have to make yourself uh, was the single best time saver. And I did very well in that course. Um, And I actually found out uh, during that course about inkling, um, which is I-N-K-L-I-N-G, where you can get a lot of textbooks, medical textbooks. Uh, They are full price, but you only have to buy them by the chapter. Uh, so you can only buy what you need if you want to and, and just try them out. And they even have free chapters, I think one free chapter for every book. Uh, and the anatomy books that were on there, um, of course, you'll only need one, but um, they're, they're very good. And that helped me a lot. But, but then the flashcard method did not work at all for biochem. You know, you have to completely change the way you're studying and what you're doing uh, from course to course. And that may uh, be personal habits or it may be your technology or it may be both. Yeah. Awesome. So lots of fun apps to go spend some money on and test out. And, but at the end of the day, it's, it's time to put your head down and get some work done. Yeah. You definitely don't want to play around with the apps. You want to, um, pick one or two, get really good at them and, and get the content down because you don't, you don't have time to mess around with the tech too much as much as I would love to. (laughs) Neil, what's what's your s- some parting words of wisdom as as we wrap up here? I think just remember where you're headed. I think one of the more difficult things as an older um, post back, <laughs> older pre med, is 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 you know I'm, I remember sitting down that first day and. Um, there are two girls across from me in, in bio lab, and one of them said, how old are you? How old are you? Oh, I'm 18. And the other girl wouldn't answer. She says, oh, I'm so old. I'm 26. And, and I thought, boy, I'm glad they're not asking me because, you know, they don't want to know how old I am. And, it, you know, it was very difficult to, to get lost in, will I ever make it? Will I ever get there? Um, you know, why am I having to memorize all of these types of things, some of which, you know, I, I won't need on this journey where I want to go down. But, uh, they're not just hoops you have to jump through. It's it's the testing process, and 
And whether or not you need all of that information is, is in some ways irrelevant. You're proving that you can be successful at learning new stuff that's very difficult in very limited periods of time because when you're in the emergency department and you have no idea what's going on and yet this patient is obviously very sick, you have to have already proven that you are able to stay in a tough situation, find out the correct information very quickly um, to help this person out that's in front of you. And just remembering that that's where you're headed. You're headed towards patient care. But um, we do have to prove ourselves in order to get there. But don't get lost in those details. Just do what it takes to be successful, um, meet those goals, and don't forget that ultimately you're headed towards patient care. And... um, and it is fun. It's fun once you get there. Even though you don't know all of what you need to know as a third and fourth year student, um, once you start interacting with patients, you will see why you went through all of that and you'll realize it was worth it. All right. Again, that was Neil Christopher. Uh, that was awesome stuff. Again, non traditional. The majority of you out there that listen to this podcast, at least that responded to a survey that I did not too long ago, you're a non-traditional student, so hopefully some of this stuff rings true for you. Hopefully some of his stories are, are will help you on your journey when you get there and, and as you're going through it now. So thank you, Neil, for taking the time to talk to us. If you enjoyed today's podcast and you have not yet, go to medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes, and we would love a rating and review. Even if you don't listen to us on iTunes, it helps us dramatically if you leave us a rating and review in iTunes. That's how Apple and iTunes knows who's listening and who likes us and and whether or not they should uh, promote our podcast inside of iTunes. So if you haven't yet, medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes, and you can do that. We've had a couple new five-star reviews since last week. We have Adam79DC, who says, great content. He says, this is, the, this is a great podcast for both traditional and non-traditional pre-med students. Um, Melaror, Meliorora, <laughs> JNM, says, this is the place for pre-meds. Opoli says, love this podcast. And we have a couple more. I'll read them next week. Um, again, thank you to everyone that has left us a five-star rating and review. We're up over 220 five-star ratings at this point, and it's awesome. You can shoot me an email. My email is ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. If you have any questions, shoot me an email there, or you can go to medicalschoolhq.net slash question and leave us a question there. Don't forget to check out our partner magazine, premedlife.com. They're a bi-monthly magazine with tons of great content for pre-med students specifically. Go to premedlife.com and check out that podcast. And don't forget, at the beginning of the podcast, I mentioned if you're one of the lucky ones that's taking the MCAT before it changes uh, after January 2015, go to nextsteptestprep.com. And check out their one-on-one tutoring packages and mention that you heard about them on the podcast and you'll get $100 off. Normally only $50 if you mention the podcast. So $100 off. Go check it out. Nextsteptestprep.com. All right, that's it for today. I hope you learned a ton that will help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. And as always, I hope you join us next time here at the Medical School Headquarters Podcast.